Hey, you know what word I hate? I hate, I hate the word values. I hate the way we use and confuse that word in any case. You hear people talk about American values or Christian values as if they were, these were just things we happen to value because of where we come from or what religion we are. Or you hear someone say, as someone who opposes abortion, I value the life of unborn children. Guess what? You don't have a right not to value the life of unborn children. You didn't give those lives their value. Their value is inherent in their lives, just as the value of your life is inherent in yours. What you're really trying to say is killing the child is immoral because it has value. Value in the sense we use it is something humans give to things, and it's variable. A stock's value goes up and down according to what we'll pay for it. Having a neat desk is something some people value and others don't care about. We confuse that use with the moral meaning of the word where something has value, has inherent value, like human life or human freedom. Therefore, we have a moral responsibility to preserve it. That's a different use of the word. And here's why I bring this up. When Donald Trump was elected, the left told us that with Trump, we had entered a post-fact world. The media almost immediately began using the term lie, Trump lied, to characterize the president's exaggerations, his careless talk, and his Carney Barker self-promotion. Trump co-opted their phrase fake news, but it was the left that came up with fake news first. That was their attempt to characterize and demonize and censor the conservative commentary, which the left felt had helped snatch their victory from their grasping, greedy little hands. Well, the left is right about this. Facts are thin on the ground right now. Donald Trump is part of that, but he's only a small part. When it comes to lying, our president is a rank amateur next to the Democrats and their media. They're the ones who have peddled fact-free narratives about the prevalence of racism in America, about the causes of violence involving guns, and about the nature of climate change and what, if anything, we can do about it. And as I've said repeatedly this week, all that is part of a greater narrative designed to convince us to give up our individual and representative power into their above-mentioned, grasping, greedy little hands. So yes, because the left owns so much of this country's communication real estate, and because they're selling narratives instead of truth, the facts are harder and harder to come by, and the facts do matter. But the facts only matter within a moral context, and I believe every fact and every story we tell about that fact must be told in the moral context of freedom. Preserving freedom is not a value. It's a moral imperative based on the fact that freedom has value. God tells us it has value by giving us free will, by allowing us to choose evil He's telling us that our freedom is more important even than good, for the simple reason that you can't actually be good unless you're free to choose good. Freedom is God's plan for human life. It should not be sacrificed to any make-believe emergency, any narrative, any high-sounding, sweeping solution to the world's problems. Freedom comes first because it is the most valuable thing we have, whether we value it or not. I'll talk about this crazy CNN uh, I don't know, what do they call it, a town hall. It was just a bloviating disaster of incredible proportions. But, but, very, very revealing. The Democrats can't talk without revealing themselves, and they did reveal themselves, and uh, I'll talk about that. The science on whether rising temperatures, and temperatures, I think, have been rising somewhat, the, the story on the question of whether that increases hurricanes is completely unknown. Nobody knows. There have not been any more hurricanes recently. The question is, does it make them more powerful? Does it make those hurricanes more powerful? We don't know. Even the UN, which has been pushing climate change like crazy, doesn't know whether hurricanes get more powerful, just in the same way that they don't know whether it makes uh, fires worse. What really, it seems, it happens, it seems like there are fewer Far, forest fires, but they burn worse because of poor forest management. That's what it seems like but there's a lot of science that's unsettled, this whole thing. However, is that unsettled on CNN? No, 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 my friends. On CNN, the science is done completely in the laboratories of their imagination, and they've got it all figured out. This is what CNN is selling about Dorian. This cut five. We're seeing uh, firsthand the effects of climate change as a powerful Atlantic hurricane is sitting right now off the coast of Florida. It could make landfall tomorrow in South Carolina. More extreme weather events like Hurricane Dorian that's churning toward the Carolinas right now. Think bigger fires in the West or deadlier heat waves, supercharged storms like the one we've seen now, Hurricane Dorian, which is hovering off the coast of the Carolinas as I speak. When you look at the severe weather, yeah. uh, certainly we're seeing it with the hurricane now.
Yeah. Sandra. The top Democratic presidential candidates are all with us tonight on the heels of the deadly Hurricane Dorian, which is leaving neighborhoods underwater in the Bahamas, utter devastation. It now heads north along the United States coast. You know, the storm comes as we are facing a catastrophe of unprecedented proportions. You know, Hurricane Dorian is just one, right? One thing, right? One sign of that dangerous world that scientists say we are entering if humans do not cut carbon pollution. Flooded coastal cities, island nations underwater. We're coming to you, of course, tonight just as Hurricane Dorian, the strongest storm anywhere on the planet this year has decimated parts of the Bahamas and is threatening the East Coast. Talking about superstorms and mass extinction, worsening drought. <laughs> they got it all figured out on CNN. They don't, they don't actually need scientists. They just have little scientists in their brains who run around doing experiments in their imagination, getting the results that they want to get. You could even hear the way Anderson Cooper was talking when he said the, the worst storm anywhere on the planet this year. So, so it's a bad storm. We've had bad storms before. If my anecdotal memory is any uh, use at all, when I was a kid, storms were much, much worse. Uh, you know, we had these hurricanes. I remember my backyard. I was I lived out on Long Island. I remember these uh, storms that absolutely flooded our neighborhoods, flooded. Uh, and we were not that far. We were fairly far inland, but we would just get absolutely flooded. Uh, guys and hip waders coming down the, the, uh, the street to make sure everybody was all right. Boats being overturned. Then they stopped for a while. They seemed to get uh, better. And now they're seeming, we're seeming to see some of these storms again. But of course, it's the reporting. You just heard, I mean, you heard that. You heard that. That is completely fact free reporting. That is fact free, free reporting. They do not have proof that the Dorian has anything to do with climate change. And they haven't proved that climate change is, is a uh, result of human activity. Look, I, I, the climate is changing, the climate always changes. Human activity does create heat. I'm sure it does create, uh, have an effect on the climate. We just don't know if it's catastrophic. When they call you a denier, I mean, here, when I talk about, when I talk about fact-free, when I talk about things that are fact-free, they call you a denier because that is a way of comparing people who disagree with the Democrat panic on this, the CNN panic, that complete, diso this completely dishonest reporting on CNN, they're comparing you to Holocaust deniers. The Holocaust the most completely documented atrocity in human history, okay? I mean, the Nazis, say what you will about them, they kept good records, you know? They kept good records, and we have their testimony, and we have the testimony of people who were there, and we have movies, we have all this. If you're denying the Holocaust, it's because you are an anti-Semite. That's why people deny That's why people deny the Holocaust, or you're a nutty conspiracy theorist. If you are denying that a computer model can predict the climate long into the future, you're simply being sensible and sane, right? The climate is a vastly, vastly complex system that computers have not predicted very uh, soundly in the past. So we simply don't know what's going on. Look, and, and the other thing is, even, even in the worst, even in the worst climate predictions, the cost is not that bad. You know, the cost of climate change is not that bad. But it is if you're listening to CNN. So let's take a look. Let us listen and take a look to some of the stuff that was said yesterday. That, you know, this is before the CNN town hall, but we should hear from Pete Buttigieg. I mean, Pete Buttigieg is telling you exactly, exactly what the Democrats want to say. There were floods and fires and storms before, but the severity and the frequency of these weather events is unquestionably accelerating. And it is simply unacceptable that we're having a debate over whether to deal with climate change. The only acceptable debate is how to deal with it. That's the first thing I'm taking away. So no debate, folks. And, and everything he just said is untrue. First of all, they weren't even able, able to measure hurricanes the same way we can measure them now. So they don't have a lot of data. Temperature, too. They have not been able to measure temperature, global temperature. A lot of these global temperature uh, statistics are kind of meaningless. They don't really have a good way of measuring global temperature. And, it, and it's not the same as their way of measuring it now, which has gotten better. So when he says there shouldn't be a debate, that's the point. That is the point. I keep telling you this, you know, it's about not stopping the debate. It's always about making you listen to the way they talk. You're a denier. You're a denier. Denier. Well, who was it? Chuck Todd on NBC said, we're not going to have deniers on the air anymore. You're banned. You're banned from expressing your opinion. A lot of good scientists, a lot of important scientists say the whole thing is a hoax. A lot of important scientists say that it's not as bad as they say it is. And just the facts on the ground, the things that they're saying, the way they report climate change brings the panic. They want to bring the panic. Again, the narrative is always about power. The narrative is always about transferring representative power and electoral power from you to 
unelected administrative agencies like the EPA. That's the point. That is the point where all these narratives are about, whether it's race, guns, it's always about taking power away from the individual and putting it not in a, a government that represents the individual, the government of your state, the government of, uh, of the Congress that we elected, but into these administrative agencies over which you have no power and which can make law and also enforce the law and also try you for breaking the law. So that's, that's the thing that they're trying to move toward because they've got this. They know what's supposed to be done. So now let's take a look at some of the nuttiness they're talking about. And if you want nuttiness, the guy to turn to always, Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden was talking on the CNN thing was unbelievable. It, it, it causes everything. It's cut six. And so where are we? Look what happened in Darfur. What's Darfur all about? Darfur is all about the fact that the sub-Saharan desert, because of the change in climate, no longer had enough arable land. Look what's happening in Indonesia. They're talking about moving their capital because it's going to sink. What happens if you get 10, 12, 13, 15, 100 million people on the move? That causes wars. And so it's well beyond whether or not it affects me personally, which it does, and it did my family and still does, just like your families. This is personal. It's personal. Every one of you probably have a story that can talk about what's happened to something you care greatly about, whether it's a species or it's your son or daughter coming down with cancer mm. because of it. <laughs> what? First, I'm sorry. I mean, Darfur, Darfur was a terrible, terrible tragedy. It was a racial, uh, it was a, you know, it was a genocide. It was a genocidal war. <laughs> And, you know, that, that, that was to blame on sunshine. It was just too much sunshine that caused people to commit genocide. We never had genocide before. Oh, genocide is new. Cancer. Cancer is now climate, uh, climate change related. All of a sudden, And then his eye exploded, by the way, which was really <laughs> kind of stole the whole show in the middle of this thing. I guess a blood vessel in his eye broke and it was like his eyes filled up with blood. Uh, I'm telling you, Joe Biden is not going anywhere. It's like at some point people are just going to pull the plug on this campaign. Recently, he started saying, you know, his campaign started saying, we don't have to win Iowa. If he doesn't win Iowa, that's the end of his campaign. The reason is his whole campaign is he's electable. He's the electable guy. And he keeps pushing himself to the left and becoming less electable. So it doesn't really matter. Right now, I'm guessing Elizabeth Warren, but if he, if he loses Iowa, that pulls out the electable narrative, and I, I believe he'll plummet after that. I do not believe his poll numbers will survive uh, a loss in Iowa. These guys always think that they're going to come back later, but I don't know. I, I Obviously, just guessing, but that's the way it looks to me. The most revealing thing anybody said came from Bernie Sanders, and the reason that Bernie Sanders says the most revealing things is because Bernie Sanders is a true believer. I mean, Bernie Sanders is the one guy who's saying something that he has believed all his life, which was the Soviet Union would have worked if we had just turned, flicked the right switch. I mean, the guy is a communist. He is not a socialist. This whole thing about Democrat socialist, you know, who was it? Erdogan, I think, uh, in Turkey, who said that uh, democracy is like a streetcar. You get off when you reach your destination. That's the kind of Democrats, Democrat socialists are. Once they get what they want, Believe me, democracy will be over. Electoral college will stack the Supreme Court. They don't want democracy now. They don't believe in your power now. How, how are they going to believe it once they get their hands on the levers of creativity, on the levers of, uh, of commerce, on the levers of finance? What, what do you how do you think they're going to give it back? They won't even let England have its government back. What makes you think they're going to give you your power back once they get it? His comment on climate change, to me, he was asked a question about overpopulation and to me, this is the entire Democrat, uh, the entire Democrat philosophy laid bare. Human population growth has more than doubled in the past 50 years. The planet cannot sustain this growth. I realize this is a poisonous topic for politicians, but it's crucial to face. Empowering women and educating everyone on the need to curb population growth seems a reasonable campaign to enact. Would you be courageous enough to discuss this issue and make it a key feature of a plan to address climate catastrophe? Well, Martha, the answer is yes. <laughs> and the answer has everything to do with the fact that women in the United States of America, by the way, have a right to control their own bodies and make reproductive decisions. And the Mexico City Agreement, which denies American aid to those organizations around the world, that, are, uh, that allow women to have abortions or even get involved uh, in birth control, to me, is totally absurd. So I think, especially in poor countries around the world, 
uh, where women do not necessarily want to have large numbers of babies and where they can have the opportunity through birth control to control the number of kids they have, something I very, very strongly uh, support. So basically, kill your children because the world is coming to an end. These are the progressives. These are the progressives. The progressives are telling you that human life, human business, human modernity, human progress has, is destroying the world. That's the catastrophe. And they talk about this Green New Deal. Well, well I'll get to the Green New Deal in a minute. But, and we have too many humans. You know, the only thing that matters about the earth is humans. The only thing that matters about the earth is humans. You know, people always, I, I had a guy once say to me in a gym, he said, I think the, the beauty of a leopard is more important than a human being. And I said, only a human being knows that a leopard is beautiful. Only a human being knows that. That's a word that only human beings and God understand. <laughs> there is no beauty of a leopard without human beings. The only interesting thing about this planet is that we are here. Our minds, our imaginations, our perceptions, that's it. That's it. So if you have a philosophy in which human beings are the problem, you have no problem. That's not a problem. Human beings are the answer. Human beings are the purpose of everything you do. And human freedom is the purpose of everything you do. And that's why anything these guys say, any words that come out of their mouth should always be about freedom. We should always answer it with freedom. I used, to, I used to kid around when I would see my kids. They had a game they would play when they would look at fortune cookies. They would add in bed to any uh, fortune that they got. It was supposed to be, you know, kids. They were supposed to be clever. It would say, you know, you're going to be very lucky. And they would say in bed. And then everybody would giggle. I feel we should play that same game with their solutions and, and keep our freedom. How do we preserve the environment and keep our freedom? How do we make race relations better and keep our freedom? How do we cause less violence to happen and keep our freedom? Because all of those things would get rid of every Democrat plan, every Democrat plan. We have to have guns to defend our freedom. We don't need to turn against one another, uh, you know, and turn to the government to protect us from one another because of race. We just don't have to. That's not what the facts tell us. And with this, more, most importantly, really, we cannot solve climate change in any of the ways they're talking about. And the, and the proof of it, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris was asked by, by a co clearly concerned guy, I know because he was wearing a green T-shirt, he was asked, he, he said, a lot of the people who work in the energy sector voted for Donald Trump. How are you going to convince them that you're not going to destroy their jobs? Remember Hillary Clinton went into coal country and said, I'm going to destroy the coal industry? So he, this guy asked, how are you going to make sure that you can work across the aisle to ensure that these people still have jobs? Listen really carefully to Kamala Harris's answer. How will you work across the aisle to support all workers and build trust with Republican constituents dependent on a fossil fuel economy? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, Michael. I, I think that, first of all, let me just tell you, um, I think about this issue through the lens of my baby nieces, who are one and a half and three years old. And when I look at those babies, and I think about what the world will be like in 20 years if we don't act, I'm really afraid. And as it relates to those Republicans in Congress, where I've now been for two and a half years, every one of those members need to look at the babies, the grandbabies in their life, and then look in the mirror and ask themselves, why have they failed to act? Because on the issue of this climate crisis, I'm going to tell you, I strongly believe this is a fight against powerful interests. And leaders need to lead. So lead, follow, or get out the way. If they fail to act as president of the United States, I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. <laughs> So you're listening carefully, and if you work in the uh, oil industry or in the energy industry, did you hear where she preserved your job? Did she hear where she even reached across the aisle? She's going to get rid of the filibuster, which I think they should do now because it no longer does what they're supposed to do. But she'll get rid of the filibuster to make sure that they have enough votes to put the Green New Deal in. Now, the Green New Deal is a perfect example of what I've been talking about all week, okay? When you look at the Green New Deal, it's nonsense, right? It's babbling nonsense. It's cows passing gas and ending plane travel and all this stuff. It's kind of like this dreamy thing. And they, and they all say the same thing. They all say, well, it's, a, it's an ideal. It's an idea. It's a dream. It's supposed to be a law. In the old days, not that long ago, legislators had to be policy experts. They had to know, or their interns and their researchers had to teach them about policy. They had to understand what could be done 
what it would cost, how it would affect uh, the people constitutionally, how it would affect their freedom. Okay, they had to know that because the law had to be specific enough to tell people what they were going to do. It had to say, now you're going to have to do this, this, and this so that you could go to court and say, hey, that violates my constitutional rights. They don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because all they do is they say to some agency, clean the air. Clean, bleak, go, go forth and clean the air. And then the EPA comes in and says, you can't flush your toilet anymore. And people go nuts and they say, well, it's the EPA's fault. We, we didn't, that's not what we, you know, yeah, that's not us. That's not us. Don't, don't uh, throw us out of office. That's the EPA. Ooh, the Republicans will say, ooh, that EPA, it's, it's going too, way too far, way too far. But look at the laws they pass or don't pass, right? They don't pass laws that tell people what to do. And they say to the court, and the courts have said, well, the EPA, no, they, they are the ones, they're the experts. We defer to the EPA. Well, nonsense, nonsense. At what point in that process do you have any power? None. That's what the Green New Deal is about. The Green New Deal is an absolute blithering nonsense that is meant to give absolute power to administrative agencies. And I know this is a little wonky, but it's where your freedom goes. The system is simple. The original system is simple. You elect somebody to represent you in Congress. He represents you by passing laws that represent what you want, that do what you want. That system has been completely uh, disappeared. It has been disappeared by shifting and delegating the power that we delegated to them to these agencies. That's what we're trying to do. That is what Donald Trump, in his inarticulate and sometimes bloviating way, is an expression of. It's an expression of the fact that we don't feel like we are governing ourselves anymore. That's why he's there. And believe me, for all his flaws, for all Donald Trump's flaws, the danger is not from him. He is cutting back on regulation, but he's not cutting back on the administrative state. He should be shutting some of these agencies down, and he should be working when he had the... uh, the majority in both houses, he should have been working on laws that said, no, you have to pass laws. But the thing is, the legislators don't want these laws in the same way that Parliament doesn't want its its power back from the EU. Parliament is stopping Boris Johnson from leaving the EU because they don't want to be responsible for those laws because then they're responsible to you. If they can just say, oh, it's the EU, you know, we didn't we didn't want it like that, but the EU passed this regulation, then they can stay in office forever. This is what it's all about. This is where the power all is. It's not about whether Donald Trump says stupid stuff. It's not about the fact that he's rude and, and, uh, you know, uh, belligerent. It's not about any of that. It's about where power is located. It's supposed to be located with you and with your family and with your town and with your area and with your state. Okay, and then, yes, there is supposed to be some powers that link us all together in the federal government. But those powers have been growing and growing and growing until finally we have a president from Chicago. Right. Who goes to Washington and tells people in Arkansas who should use the bathrooms in their elementary schools. Right. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way the government was shaped. And so they constantly have to be have you in a panic about the clouds. There's too many clouds up there, folks. There's too many clouds. And you are. Look, look in the mirror. Those are your children. Oh, my gosh. Those are your children. Look, my eyes are filling up with tears. Look at the clouds, children, eyes, tears. Give away your power. That's all it's about. And that's what Donald Trump. That's the meaning of Donald Trump. That's why I don't like pick on him as all the time. That's why I don't pick on every little thing he says, even though he, he sometimes annoys me, because I believe the power should be with you as deplorable as you are. And believe me, if you're listening to the show, you're deplorable. All right. We're going to stay on the air so you can all hear us. But that's all the more reason for you to feel incredible guilt and subscribe at dailywire.com. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month, a lousy 100 bucks for the year. And... For 100 bucks for the year, you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr, plus you can be in the mailbag, which we had yesterday. All Everybody's questions were answered. They're now, all their weight is off their shoulders. They're running like children through the fields with all their problems solved. That could happen to you if only you subscribe. All right. Dr. David Hogberg is a former senior fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research. He's author of Medicare's Victims, How the U.S. Government's Largest Healthcare Program programs, harms patients, and impairs physicians. Dr. Hogberg, are you there? Uh, I am, and feel free to call me David. All right, David, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, You're welcome. So all I've been hearing in this campaign season is that we need Medicare uh, for all, and mm-hmm. that I'm, I'm guessing, I'm just guessing off the top of my head that you don't think that's such a great idea. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, you got to understand that uh, any time any sort of national health care system uh, that is basically you know, controlled by politicians, 
is going to serve the interests of, of politicians. And ultimately, what that means is that people without political power, those that, you know, for example, don't amount to much on Election Day or can't protest, organize and so forth, all the things that can affect change in a, in a democracy, uh, they lose out. And you see this very seriously in systems like Britain or Canada that have you know, single payer systems, the people that suffer the most often tend to be the sickest people, people that need heart surgery, cancer treatment, um, you know, uh, hip and knee replacement. They often wait months, sometimes years for surgery. Why do politicians allow that? Well, because they feel no pressure from those folks to to change the system. Um, you know, any system has to allocate its resources, and that is a way of allocating resources in a healthcare system that does not blow back on politicians. Why is that? Well, you know, the number of people who get sick in any given year is relatively small, not enough to amount to much at the ballot box. And, you know, they're seriously sick. They've got a hundred things on their mind that they're dealing with. Uh, getting involved in politics, organizing, protesting uh, is not going to be on that list. And so if here in the U.S. we switch over to a system of Medicare for all, you will over time eventually see uh, that kind of, um, um, of resource allocation, that kind of, um, I'm sorry, what is the word I'm looking for uh, here? Um, you're going to see those kinds of waiting lists and so forth, uh, that kind of rationing word I'm looking for, you'll see that kind of uh, rationing develop here in the U.S. So, you know, when it comes to health care, you want the, 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 the two main people who should have power are the patient and the health care provider, you know, usually the doctor. You don't want to hand your health, the, the power over your health care to politicians because they have their own interests and oftentimes their interests are not going to coincide with what your interests are. So what do you say then to the people? Uh, obviously, the argument is without the government, Healthcare is simply too expensive, and the the people who are, let's say, lower middle class, can't afford uh, the kinds of treatment that they need. What do you say to them? I would say nonsense. I mean, a, a free market uh, finds ways to bring um, expensive things and lower the cost to 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 people. I mean, at one point, automobiles were beyond the 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 means of everybody except the the very rich. Now, even the very poor can afford an automobile. Our healthcare system would work the same way if we started removing all the the enormous amount of government regulations and laws and so forth that that govern the healthcare system, and 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 in fact lead to uh, uh, how expensive it often is. If we were to let the market work properly, if we were to have a free market in healthcare, you would see uh, more and more of the expensive treatments. Uh, you know, the, their costs would go down. It would be easier for people to to afford them, even if you know they were to pay for them out of pocket. And it would ultimately make insurance more affordable as as well. So this notion that you know government needs to get involved to uh, make the cost lower. Um, I'm I'm hard press to find any to think of any example in which the government getting involved has ever made the cost lower. Yeah. Uh, it's almost I mean, I'm sure there's got to be one out there. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the law of averages being what it is, but it's rare and it's not going to and it's certainly not going to work in a system that is is immensely complex as our healthcare system. So people say, uh, you know, if, if you get if you get sick in this country, you can always go to the ER and the ER will not turn you away. And we're all paying for that anyway. So why shouldn't we all pay for the same for the whole system? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> have you ever gone to an ER uh, on like a busy you know, weekday <laughs> yeah. or, or weekend? I mean, yeah. is that really what we want our our um, our healthcare system to, to look like? I mean, usually the ERs are incredibly crowded. It takes you uh, often, you know, unless you're you know, absolutely dying. Uh, it takes you forever to get uh, get treated. It's it's sort of a microcosm of what you see with you know major medical treatment in places like the UK and Canada. Long, long waits for 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 uh, for treatment, and um, you know that is sort of a microcosm of what you will get when you know sort of everybody has to pay for the healthcare system via uh, uh, you know via our taxes, and you know the government politicians have inordinate control over it. Can, can you explain why drugs in this country are so expensive compared to other countries and whether or not that has to do with too much government or too little? Oh, uh, well, number one, I mean, uh, drugs are treat cheaper in other countries because they have uh, most other countries impose price controls on drugs. But that has a big impact in that most other countries don't have 
uh, don't do a lot of research and design into into drugs. Uh, most new drugs are developed here in the U.S. where um, you know you pay the cost not just for the drug but but for the and distribution but but for research and design as well. Other countries they tend to set the price at just to cover you know the distribution and the and the production. Um, and, you know, but there is other reasons. I mean, we have a very long process with regard to the FDA. We also have a, a uh, patent system that, you know, allows drug companies to, um, uh, you know, keep a drug away from um, generics for, uh, and, and decreases competition. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, drug companies need to have some patent protection. I mean, you, you create a product you know, you should be able to benefit from the creation of that for a while uh, before people are able to copy it with generics. That said, what you should do is look at the FDA approval process, find ways to shorten that, and then find ways to shorten and then maybe perhaps shorten the patent length for, uh, you know, a, a commensurate amount. Uh, that would go a long way to, to driving down drug costs in, uh, in the U.S. As, as healthcare gets better, as they develop new techniques and new machines and, and all this, is it possible that the best cures are going to be so increasingly expensive that they'll only be available to the very rich? I mean, I suppose that's the the kind of nightmare scenario that the that people who want government health care are always proposing to us. I mean, take a take any treatment that we have today that you consider commonplace uh, that at one point was, uh, again, primarily uh, the, the purview of, of of the wealthy. I mean, markets drive down the price of things um, over time. And, uh, you know, there isn't a single, I mean, the computers that you and I are using now, <laughs> I mean, you and I, 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 no disrespect, but I assume that you're old enough, I know I'm old enough to remember when, you know, buying a per personal computer was $2,000 and it did maybe one one hundredth of what these computers <laughs> yeah. do today. Yeah. Uh, you know, the price has gone down, the quality has gone up. Why? Because computers are a relatively unregulated uh, market. They're relatively unfettered by government. Our healthcare system would look a lot more like that if we were to make it more unfettered. Okay, so President Trump gets reelected. Your phone rings, and it's the Donald, and he says, <laughs> what, "And he says, what? What do I do? What's what? What do I present to Congress? What would you say?" I would say start with something that's free market, but is relatively modest in scope. Um, and, and because that's what the left has done with with the health care system over time, they the, the big ticket items like, you know, the passage of Medicare in 65 or the more recent passage of Obamacare, those are rare and those are hard to pass because they're so big. They affect so many segments of society and they're just they're they're an easy political target because of that. What the left has mostly done over time is pass maybe small, medium sized things. And over time has just, you know, over decades really expanded government scope over health care. What I would do is something more modest and something that, that's very hard to, to uh, 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 you know, which would make it harder for, um, you know, opponents to attack. What I would do is, is start with something like, you know, targeting small businesses, which are having a harder and harder time affording health insurance. Allow them to fund large health savings accounts like, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars per individual um, uh, for, for their employees, because, you know, they may not small businesses may not be able to afford um, health insurance, but they could certainly afford many of them afford to put a couple thousand dollars in those uh, large health savings accounts. Mm -hmm. Let individuals top them off if they want. Uh, you can use a large health savings account to purchase insurance, buy health care directly, and then let individuals take that if they work for a small business get that uh, large health savings account, and then they move to any other business, a large business or on their own, a uh, private, you know, individual contractor or whatever, uh, let them keep that and let uh, a big business fund it once, you know, once they have it. What that would do is, first of all, you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm helping small businesses help their employees with, with health care costs. Um, you know, so it's, it's targeted. Second, you you're kind of slipping the 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 nose of the free market camel there under the tent. Hmm. You know, big businesses are going to start looking at that and go and say, you know, that's a good system. Why can't we have that as well? Hmm. You know, and individual contractors or you know individuals saying, you know, well, small business, why have that? Why can't I have that as well? You know, something more modest, but something that starts moving us along the road to to greater healthcare freedom. Wow, those are really good specific suggestions. I hope they do call you uh, the next administration. <laughs> Dr. David Hogberg, uh, author of Medicare's Victims, thank you very much for coming on. That was really interesting. Thanks a lot.
Well, thank you, and uh, feel free to have me back. I, I would have you back. <laughs> I will. Thanks. All right. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, give us a five-star review. And also tell your friends to subscribe, too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out the other Daily Wire podcasts, including The Ben Shapiro Show, The Matt Wall Show, and The Michael Knoll Show. Thanks for listening. We are hurtling toward the day when climate change could be irreversible. I've seen sea levels already altering this nation's coast. China's capital is choking in its worst pollution of the year. Five percent of species will become extinct. Sea levels rising, glaciers melting. Carbon emissions are rising and faster than most scientists predicted. But many climate change alarmists seem to claim that all climate change is worse than expected. This ignores that much of the data is actually more encouraging than expected. Yes, Arctic sea ice is melting faster than models expected, but models also predicted that Antarctic sea ice would decrease, yet Antarctic sea ice is increasing. Yes, sea levels are rising, but the rise is not accelerating. If anything, two recent papers, one by Chinese scientists published in January 2014 and the other by US scientists published in May 2013, have shown a small decline in the rate of sea level increase. We are often being told that we are seeing more and more droughts, but a study published in March 2014 in the journal Nature actually shows a decrease in the world's surface that has been afflicted by droughts since 1982. Facts like these are important because a one-sided focus on worst-case stories is a poor foundation for sound policies. Hurricanes are likewise used as an example of things getting worse. But look at the US, where we have the best statistics. If we adjust for population and wealth, hurricane damage during the period of 1900 to 2013 actually decreased slightly. At the UN Climate Conference in Lima, Peru in December 2014, attendees were told that their countries should cut carbon emissions to avoid future damage from storms like Typhoon Hagupit, which hit the Philippines during the conference killing at least 21 people and forcing more than a million into shelters. Yet the trend for strong typhoons around the Philippines have actually declined since 1950, according to a study published in 2012 by the Journal of Climate. Again, we're told that all things are getting worse, but the facts don't support this. This does not mean global warming is not real or a problem, but the one-sided story of alarmism makes us lose focus. If we want to help the world's poor, who are the most threatened by natural disasters, it's less about cutting carbon emissions than it is about pulling them out of poverty. The best way to see this is to look at the world's death from natural disasters over time. In the Oxford University database for death rates from floods, extreme temperatures, droughts and storms, the average in the first part of last century was more than 130 dead every year per million people. Since then, the death rates have dropped 97% to a new low in the 2010s of less than 4 per million. The dramatic decline is mostly due to economic developments that help nations withstand catastrophes. If you are rich like Florida, a major hurricane might cause plenty of damage to expensive buildings, but it kills few people and causes only a temporary dent in economic output. If a similar hurricane hits a poorer country like the Philippines or Guatemala, it kills many more people and can devastate the economy. So let's be clear, climate change is not worse than we thought. That doesn't mean it's not a reality or not a problem. It is. But the narrative that the world's climate is changing from bad to worse is unhelpful alarmism that prevent us from focusing on smart solutions.